everyone. My name is Moshe Tsioni, and I'm here to talk about uh, today to talk about um, application security at scale. How do we do that, and what what is contextual application security? I'm bringing up a presentation. By the way, excuse me if uh, something is a bit quirky. This is the first time I'm I'm uh, doing OASP over. Uh, virtual, so this is pretty exciting for me as well. So thank you for joining. As I said, we are talking today about normalizing APSEC issues for contextual risk-based prioritization and enterprise scale. And this very long, I would admit very, very long um, headline is all supposed to say that what we have today as an APSEC issues, we don't really do that um, along the lines of context. And i am trying to prove uh, the point throughout the, uh, the presentation. So my name is Moshe Tsioni. I've been around for about 20 plus years in the InfoSec communities, especially in Israel, in the US, uh, in different positions and different uh, passions, but all together security research, of course, this is the sole purpose for our being. Um, mainly considered myself as a pen, pen tester and bug bounty hunter. And for the past nine years, I've been uh, devising more de detection and prevention algorithms on uh, on different uh, scales. Uh, last uh, On my last past life was in Akamai, I was director of threat research there, uh, designing and uh, controlling all of the cloud security solutions of uh, Akamai. And now in Apiro, we're doing, we are doing this, we are securing the life cycle of, uh, of the development. And I will talk about that and, and we'll share some of our knowledge here uh, by that. And of course, I'm not, uh, uh, there's so reason for that is to share with the community and to see how can we change uh, things that are still very, very slow and to try to bring it up to um, enterprise scale. So starting with why are we actually discussing that and why it's so important? So first of all, what we see in DevOps for the past few years, and maybe more than that actually, is that more and more automation is, is coming to place and DevOps uh, plays a key role into how fast can we release our, our applications nowadays. Traditional security says that it's a very manual, very process heavy, and by that it really, it really doesn't compabulate with the DevOps uh, philosophy. And we try always, we always try in the community to bridge those gaps together. Uh, and by that, we also look at it as, as a more modern approach versus traditional approach. The current approaches that we see more and more in the, on the arena of application security lifecycle is that we see more and more secure design, if it's more of a threat modeling standards and the way we are doing secure code practices. Uh, of course, all of that is, is comes together to uh, what kind of knowledge we have in the community and how do we uh, exercise this knowledge, um, especially when we are looking at what, what verification mechanisms we have developed over the years and uh, what, what, kind of, what are we as enterprises are using nowadays. So what we always see is that SCA, of course, taking place, composition of those software that we are using and packages to see what kind of dependencies, what are the, those dependencies, capabilities, vulnerabilities, licenses. If we look at a, at a SaaS test and YAS uh, application security testing, mostly what we see is, of course, many vulnerabilities being found, uh, 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 a load of vulnerabilities that we need to tackle uh, by that. And this is, this is the minimum. On top of that, we all, always we also trying to uh, starting to see uh, test orchestration, which is very very good. We see more and more orchestration on the those arenas, uh, and by that we see that try to uh, work out an automatic uh, uh, automatic uh, workflows uh, for uh, correlating those vulnerabilities with uh, with the uh, uh, production systems, and finally fuzzing. We also see uh, continuous fuzzing going as a uh, as a trend, and we look for more and more things to do especially true while we are considering agile development. While we, th we thought of traditional security as non-agile and non-agile already, uh, what we are trying to do with current security, and when I say we, it's global, we in terms of community uh, all around the globe, is we try to keep up with the agile development uh, lifecycle trend and by the velocity that it demands. By that, to be honest, all of those systems brings up together a, a new a new kind of category and a new difficulty for us as security practitioners is to have all of those items on unders and features, and we don't try to we never try to hinder development. We try to make development fast, and that said, secure. And this is some kind of a very very tight balance we try to 
uh, to act together, but with not, not much help. And what, what I'm trying to say here is that without the context, the correct context for those automatic systems, we won't be able to. We won't be able to come, uh, come along all of this uh, part that we see that we either block or and by that we are not releasing on time or we are accepting the risk for some for for any reason that we have and by that just releasing and knowing that there are risks to be taken because we don't want to hinder the release cycle uh, velocity uh, and one more challenge i will discuss before i'm going into the detail of how are we going to tackle that and what is the uh, what is the uh, what is the proposed approach here um, is that we also know that the number of security architects is still low uh, in, in regards to how many developers each architect should support. And, and of course, part of that is also really, really, really hard for those uh, architects to really have this kind of say within their platforms and enterprises is that first of all, the lack of visibility. They don't know, they can't map all the time the continuous and re really rapid development that developers right now have on their hands, especially when considering cloud services right now with infrast code and stuff like that. It really, it really it brings a lot of uh, visibility issues into, into play. Second, the, the cost of remediation is still high, which Part of the decision for the SDLC uh, uh, is very, very late into, into the SDLC lifecycle. We, we mostly see those kind of decisions taking place on the release side. So it's very far away, far, far right, what is said with the uh, DevSoc, DevSecOps uh, communities, really far right on the scale of where remediation should be taking place while trying to make a shift left, make, making this kind of remediation decisions as early as we can in this design and development of the, those kind of features and, uh, and code. And, and lastly, slow time to market. We try to do everything automatic and not manual. All of those kind of things and the things that you see on the screen are really pu putting the architect in a very tight position. Uh, on top of what all, all, all have been said right now, we, we, we shouldn't forget that the issues themselves are just accumulating and those kind of issues can come from either automatic or manual tests that we are doing uh, along those STLCs that we have. Uh, on top of that, if you we just need a quick reminder, our supply chain attacks that we see more and more over the past two years is not going away anywhere. And this is a new, I won't say actually not a new type of attack, but uh, something that has been just trending with attackers for the past few years. And more and more, we are more conscious about those supply chain attacks nowadays. So there are three things that we're going to discuss. One is how to bring, how to, uh, why contextual, contextual data is very important, how, what we are bringing, what we are considering con context that's re really important for us to keep. Second, on the normalization, uh, a very short maybe introduction to what is normalization and what and how to do that within your systems to be, to be aware of this normalization need. And thirdly, how do we do it at scale? If we're talking enterprise scale, we are talking tens of thousands, maybe repositories. We, uh, we've met with uh, enterprises that have new repository every day or even more than that. So at scale, it's very, very important for us as well. So we are going to touch upon that and we're going to finalize with the takeaways for you. So let's start with contextual. What we are trying to do with, with context is that we are trying to, to bring along this kind of idea which we know that a Jira ticket can be, for example, this is starting with design. So someone needs a, a feature to collect something. So John goes, goes ahead and do a code change according to Jira ticket and start to, to tweak the API logic. Then we can see a cloud change because we need to expose this kind of API on the API gateway that we have. So someone is making sure that the code that, uh, that is configuring the API gateway is being updated as well, maybe uh, the same way that John is doing that, maybe on, on the same uh, computer or maybe even on the same breath, if it's very, very easy. Um, on top of that, all of that really affects the PII field that is being added because of this need of the new data. And, and if, if, it's not, uh, if it's not enough, he, he should also uh, apply this kind of uh, uh, application on a daily basis and then deploy it uh, to, to the cloud. So all of those things are new events. And, and, and by that, you also can think of what kind of semantic context we can bring to the table. Specifically, if someone commented on the, on the uh, push request from, uh, uh, from John, 
And, uh, and more than that, if we, if we actually look at the API that we have been exposed, maybe the API is, is not considering of, uh, authorization at all. And lastly, what we are seeing here are very critical pieces of information that first of all are not strung together, meaning they are not interconnected some way to bring that all into one story. And second, the important pieces of information, which is a new change, which is which the API configuration is not including something or including something or touching upon a specific mechanism that is important for us. And by that, this context bring, brings us the idea of why it's important, why it's more important than others, why it's a material change, why is something that is worth our time. Remember that the accumulating issues will never stop and we'll need to either um, shoot them away very, 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 very uh, um, uh, fast, or uh, we are going to tackle them with some uh, context and by that have the, this priority, priority also in place. And no one currently is looking at that. So we don't have the power uh, and the community to do that. So that's part of what we are trying to do. And if we're looking at the sequential model that the DevOps, uh, DevSecOps have, we also see uh, those kind of caveats all the time. What is, the, what, what is going on in the security design and what kind of solutions you're going, you going to use? And all of that, uh, if we look at the um, infinity uh, aid that we see on the DevSecOps cycle, we understand that this cycle is not, not really a cycle more than something that, that is being done all together as, as an agile model uh, alongside each other. So the, the correct way to, to, to see that is the continuous model that we all, and we never, we never stop doing planning, we never stop doing creating, and it's not, not something that we are uh, going to uh, block by each other. And that's the way, by the way, that developers are working on it. Maybe they are working on one feature uh, each, but it's, it's uh, because of how Git works and how Git operations are working right now. It, it's ena it enables them to work very, very fast on different branches without, um, without considering each other. Uh, and by that, it's, it's still, they have the, the ability to release the stuff very, very uh, fast if we are not considering security for a second. All of that comes together to one point, that the inventory itself that we have is, is incomplete and we need to have this kind of information together to have this kind of context. Now, finally, when we look at all, all what we said, is the thing that we are trying to, to mangle together, uh, to wrangle together in order to have context is the code itself. This is pretty uh, straightforward to understand. We have a Git repository. We have the history maybe of the Git repository or repositories, plural, I should say. Uh, contributors, which, which of contributors have contributed what, what to where and why it's important. Maybe it's a new developer. It's a different risk for a new developer if it's a a developer that already touched upon a mechanism of authentication, and next time he's going to touch upon an authentication mechanism, he will be less risky statistically by someone that never touched upon the authentication mechanism, and it's it's his first uh, uh, day on the job maybe. Uh, so the, the con contributor uh, um, context is very very important. It was one of the um, biggest things that we are looking at when we are looking at context. Uh, lastly, this kind of semantic discussion, met metadata for tickets, is very important as well. So it gives us a lot of context information about what happened and the journey that the feature have gone through from design to code to the cloud itself. And all of this is being funneled into what we call material changes again. Uh, so what is important in the change, not just a change. Uh, a line of code that has been changed is nothing uh, important in, let's say, in the color of the login page is not something of a material change. Uh, for uh, in terms of perspective of the, of the code itself. It's something that is not considering, mostly not considering anyone else in terms of material change for security. And this is why it's very important for us to tackle the security, uh, the security elements and not every kind of code in the same time uh, or in the same level. So all of that, after we have material changes and we understand the context of them, we can really point out what are the risky material changes. And when we have all of this together, we can really point out why it's the high risk from that from that lot of the risky material changes and decide of what to do. And then we can wisely uh, distribute our resources over that and to have a, a wise uh, workflow for each one. One can can uh, demand the penetration testing, while other uh, should have a code review for a second, um, for example. 
So all this again is a, is some, some, something that we are taking into uh, into account. Now, very uh, what what we said so far maybe made sense, but let's go uh, for uh, for a three for a use case that we used. So uh, a few. Um, uh, just a, a year ago, uh, uh, there was a PHP um, uh, a, a PHP core attempt on uh, backdooring the PHP core code, and by that we we took the code, we took the all of the history of the commits and especially uh, the semantic uh, ideas and metadata that they have on the code uh, journey that they they took if it's, if the the PRs and commits that it that it have, and we uh, found it through uh, what we have on. On, um, on with uh, the, the models that we have for anomaly detection. Now you can think of uh, multiple anomaly detection uh, uh, items, but in general, those items can be, can we parsed it and then the, we looked in, the, in, in these anomalies and then we, we have scored those anomalies. Altogether, when we only looked at the, at the critical scores, we came up with one single commit, which is evidently was the commit that was the vector itself, because the way the, the developer was behaving before that wasn't fitting to the way the, uh, the and behavior that the, the developer have been committed, allegedly committed this malicious uh, commit. Normalization, I'm going fast over that because there is not much to say, but because it's really important to understand the data, but three takeaways from, from the normalization, the data itself, especially from different tools, won't have a normalized idea of what is the distribution like and shouldn't consider the scoring to be consistent. So, so making coherency over this kind of data, feed, data feeds is very, very important. And keep in mind that sometimes even the same data feed would, would not have co uh, a coherent scoring because it won't have considering the context of the environment that it lives in. So it's really important for us to normalize the data, how to normalize data, this is maybe uh, an effort for a different um, uh, slide deck next time. Lastly, on enterprise scale, we, we, we need to consider four things. We want you to consider four things. One is the general purposeness of the uh, scale itself. We can build something very specific for a specific product uh, or project and, or repo, and we need to consider the, the main idea of how workflows are going on on uh, different life cycles. And by that, we need to think ahead of what kind of uh, what is worth our time in terms of automation to fit the general purpose of uh, life cycle of developers. And we should consider this as those life cycles are agile. We shouldn't be less agile than developers themselves. Uh, Cloud-based is something that we are taking into heart because th this is, gives us a lot of freedom about um, uh, how to handle those kinds of, kind of cases, especially uh, when we are talking about resources uh, that are demanding for this kind of uh, crunching over uh, security. And lastly, performance optimization is really important to, to think about what deserves what kind of attention. Maybe something should be highlighted as the code itself is very important. If we can put out the material changes themselves, they, they deserve a better, uh, a better treatment that, than those that are not. Altogether, this brings us to, to the same idea. They take away themselves that the, the agile development cycle should be the same as the uh, agile security cycle. The context is king. We should consider context all the time. Without normalization of the data, we won't be able to actually coherently look at the data sets and, and, this, and, and uh, decide of what action should we take. And lastly, the optimization and consistency of, of automation is super important for us to for the long run altogether. That's it. I think I'm on time.